Welcome to the MCA. I'm Angelina, an apprentice for the MCA's Teen Creative Agency, and I'll be your host today. I am a young black woman wearing a blue sweater and a plaid skirt. I'm standing in front of Wendy Red Star's piece, The Last Thanks, and the MCA is based on a true story exhibition. In this episode, TV for The Last Thanks, we'll talk about Red Star's piece, The Last Thanks. Wendy Red Star is a Cree artist who lives and works in Portland, Oregon. The art you will see in this video is contemporary art. Saying art is contemporary just means it's made recently in our time. Old and historical art is special and important because through it we can learn about the past. But the art of our time is just as important because it can help us see the present and the past in new ways. When I look at this artwork, I feel captivated. The beauty of the portrait is a marvel within itself, yet the subject matter takes hold of your eyes and makes you explore all the details. Yet, this is only fully experienced when you acknowledge your relation and your positionality to the subject matter. Then you truly understand the power of this image. To create this imaginary scene you see, Wendy Redstar borrowed her composition from Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. Redstar has said, the first Thanksgiving is our last supper. Today, we'll be able to learn more about Wendy Redstar's piece, The Last Thanks. I had the honor of interviewing Wendy Redstar to learn more about the intentionality of her piece and how it felt to create The Last Thanks. While I was looking at your piece, I was kind of drawn to the skeletons and the gestures of the skeletons, as well as their missing teeth. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Uh, yes. Well, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, it's such an honor to be in the exhibition and also to be in conversation with you about this work that I created when I was a graduate student. Oh, back in 2006 at UCLA. Um, and during that time, that was sort of the first time that I had ever lived in a big city. Actually, it was the first time I've ever lived in a, a big city, hundreds of miles away from Montana and from the reservation. And um, it was really kind of soaking up Hollywood. And somehow I got my hands on this catalog that sold all sorts of like um, holiday uh, decorations. And so I was looking through um, and found these skeletons and I, I thought they were really cool. <laughs> they were super interesting. It's also in that catalog, there was a bunch of stuff on Thanksgiving um, and there were some faux headdresses with foam mm -hmm. feathers and things like that. And so I was really thinking about um, Native people and um, the destruction of uh, and genocide, it's pretty dark, of um, Native people through the colonization of this country. And so the skeletons to me seem kind of perfect for that. And I think they just came with some of their teeth missing, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> I have another question about kind of like the placing of the food as well as the food itself. How did it feel to like shop for the food knowing your intentions of the photograph and your intentions around this art piece? These were things that when I'd go to my grandmother's house um, in Lodgegrass, which is a town on, our, on the Crow Reservation, um, my dad would usually take me and my sister early in the morning um, to her house and we'd come in and she was always in the kitchen. She was, she always made a full breakfast. She made breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, and these were just the foods that I would find that weren't, um, these were the things that they bought. And um, so it was things that I was really used to. And it wasn't until I left the reservation um, and attended undergrad and even into graduate school that I started getting introduced to these different types of grocery stores because um, mm -hmm. I, I was just shopping at uh, the local grocery store which was IGA um, and there wasn't organic food or or anything like that um, and so yeah it was just a totally different food culture I think even today they talk about food deserts and I was like, mm -hmm. I was just like oh maybe we were in a food desert and, and didn't even that was just my normal because there weren't any other options um, in contrast to going to 
school at UCLA and the only grocery store that was within walking distance was the Whole Foods. And to me, that was just like, a, you know, it was kind of like a, a walking into like a fantasy land. It's so pretty. And, but then, then you see the prices and you're <laughs> like, oh, I can only afford to eat like one uh, leaf of lettuce or something like that. <laughs> you know, like there's nothing in here that I could actually buy. So then, you know, you really start thinking about like um, low, lower uh, economics and and things like that and how, you know, these foods that are um, organic and healthier are really un- unattainable and unaffordable mm-hmm. to communities like my community. So for me, shopping, that was just basically what we actually ate. In turn, that food became very poisonous to us. There's like mm-hmm. a high rate of um, diabetes and there's obesity and all of these things. And they also attribute to our our um our death basically in the end um as you've kind of elaborated this seemed to be like very personal work for you so how did it feel to like pose for the photograph take the photograph all the behind the scenes work like how were your emotions throughout that time yeah I mean this is the first time that I had been using my traditional regalia um, and it's, it's, for me, it's sort of fascinating because actually a lot of the Crow girls, when they graduate high school, will get our um, senior photos in our traditional regalia and will be in sets and things like that. So I, it kind of dawned on me later on that I had already had kind of an experience of wearing my regalia in a, in a set. Um, but that was just so normal. Everybody got their senior photo in their traditional regalia. Um, but for for me, there's something very powerful about wearing that regalia, and it's unexplainable. But I think the the dress itself, the elk tooth dress, is so powerful that um, immediately it transforms you in a way. You know, you you sort of walk differently. There's a, a heavy weight to it, and you just sort of feel very powerful in it. But for me, yeah, it was it was sort of an interesting position to have myself in it because I am so real and my experience as an Upsalaga woman is so real that I think that's really kind of the sharp clashing contrast Mm -hmm. and that piece where everything else is just a construct and and phony and things like that but all very much a product of western society 